Good evening. Hi. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the spring and to John Jay Homestead. I'm Melissa Vale, and I'm a trustee of the Friends of John Jay Homestead. And on behalf of New York State Parks and the Friends, I welcome you to the third evening in our series. Uh, of our 2016 series, Telling Stories of War. Could everyone please take a second, make sure your telephones are off, and I'm also going to remind you where the fire exits are, which is there and there, because I'm required to tell you that. I just want to make some thank yous to our Scholars Committee, whose names are on the back of your program, for their generosity with underwriting and ideas, and to our volunteers, to our members, you are our complete backbone, and I hope you can see by looking around that we, you, we spend your money well. We try to very hard. Um, and really important to the staffs of the state and friends organizations, including our executive director for three more days, Ruth Sunshine. Where's Ruth? Who, there, good. Who, um, who was the one who introduced us to Professor Robinson. And tonight, an extra thank you to our public partner, New York State, who's represented here tonight by our regional manager, Linda Cooper, since the subject of tonight's talk is that really, it's the negotiation of competing interests in public land, and that's what we do here every day. Um, upcoming events, just to demonstrate that things don't stop at John Jay when the scholars' talks are over, take a look at the back of your program. We have a whole series of gardening classes starting. We've listed the first one on your program, but they go on after that. We have our annual meeting coming up when we'll share with you some of the amazing things we've discovered in our house restoration project. Um, we have I Love My Park Day when we get together as volunteers and tear out underbrush and invasives in a most gratifying way. And on May 1st, our Carriage Barn and Visitor Centers and Discovery Centers will reopen. And before we know it, the farm market will be back. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Um, this year's theme has been telling stories of war. In January, we talked about how countries take care of their soldiers, and in our era, how their experience is expressed through song. In February, we saw how American art started diverging from European art when the colonies started feeling revolutionary. And tonight, we talk about one of the most basic responses to war, constitutions. The original model for Western constitutions was Magna Carta, signed by King John at Runnymede in 1215. And if you want to see a stone from the table at Runnymede, you can see it on the high altar at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine on 110th Street. It was given to the Episcopal Diocese by the government of England at the end of the Second World War as thanks from a grateful nation, and not everyone knows it's there. Um, and tonight we'll hear not just about Magna Carta, but about the vehicle through which it was reenacted and reinforced again and again when the kings kept repudiating and backtracking on it, the Charter of the Forest. The Forest Charter was the first regulation of public lands, the first environmental law ever, and we're seeing now how competition over public lands is becoming extremely fraught in our contemporary politics. Not that we're predicting armed standoffs at John Jay Homestead, <laughs> and not that we want to give Commissioner Harvey or Linda Cooper any of the enforcement penalties that the kings of England had in 1198, which included forfeiture of eyes and testicles. Hold that thought. <laughs> so some of you know that I like to try to find a J connection in each of these evenings. Tonight, the obvious connection is constitutions. Jay wrote the New York Constitution and was extremely influential in the ratification of the federal constitution, writing his pieces of the Federalist Papers using that table and those chairs in our own dining room. Um, but the echo runs through the Jay family for longer than the founding generation. Since constitutions are written to limit the powers of governments, not the actions of citizens, 
the anti-slavery Jays had to struggle through four generations to find a way to get rid of slavery, finally ending with Colonel William Jay in the Civil War with the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment was the first amendment to be passed restricting the rights of people, not the actions of government. And who can tell me what the second amendment was that was passed to restrict the actions of people and not the actions of the government? Anyone know? Temperance, prohibition. Yep, exactly. So, quite a connection. So. Our speaker, Nicholas Robinson, is the founder of the Environmental Law Program at Pace University. He's university professor for the environment at Pace Law School. He's adjunct professor at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. He's been referred to as a warrior in the environmental movement and has served at local, state, federal and international levels as a practicing lawyer, a policymaker, a scholar, a writer, a draftsman of legislation and treaties, a teacher, a speaker, and an all-round leader, plus his students all adore him. So please help me welcome Nick Robinson. Thank you very much. Well, I'm delighted to be here. It's a great privilege and pleasure to uh, uh, talk about John Jay and, and the law and uh, nature all in his house. So uh, the program you have has a picture of the Forest Charter on the front. And this is the Forest Charter from the British uh, Museum uh, that was actually the one that was issued in 1225. But the first Forest Charter was embedded in Magna Carta in 1215 and, and then was formally promulgated uh, in the name of Henry III in uh, 1217. And I'm gonna tell the story of uh, these uh, formative documents because they're not just ancient history. They're actually part of your theme of war, if you want, because they were born out of a very intense civil war in England. After uh, King John was too busy uh, extracting money from everybody, the rich and the poor alike, so he could try to regain his Norman lands in France. Uh, and he wanted to have an expedition to take these lands. He had to get lots of money. And so he took it from everyone. And he alienated everyone because uh, it was, as one commentator has said, sylvan gangsterism. Uh, I'll tell you the story a bit. But the people and the barons rose up against that, and they met uh, King John uh, literally in arms. Uh, all the barons from the north came down with their uh, armor, uh, their horses, and they confronted him. Uh, he could not go into London. London was on the side of those barons. Uh, he had to stay in, outside in his own areas. And they had a peace meeting uh, at Runnymede. Runnymede and the first Magna Carta were really... Uh, a peace treaty, but John never expected uh, it to last, and he signed, he didn't sign it actually, he sealed it. Uh, in those days there was no signatures, it's not clear he could sign his name. He, he was educated and very intelligent and wily, but he was not uh, literate as far as we can tell. So he, he had it sealed, um, but three months later he rejected it. And meanwhile, no sooner had he sealed it than he sent off to Pope Innocent III and said, annul this, you know, you're my feudal boss, uh, get rid of this. And the Pope did. And that launched a civil war. Uh, one side of the barons that supported John invited, uh, uh, you know, uh, conflict. Uh, uh, the other side invited King Louis of France to come across the English Channel as the presumptive person who could defeat John and become the feudal overlord of England and unite Norman interests with those of England. Uh, in 1216 or 1215, uh, as John was fighting this war, it was actually launched, uh, he ate something and got uh, a food poisoning and died. Uh, his troops went on to Lincoln, uh, and at Lincoln Fair, as it's called, Lincoln Cathedral and Castle, there was a decisive battle. Now, the head of Lincoln Castle was a woman, uh, quite a remarkable woman. Uh, and she rallied uh, the, the troops uh, in, in uh, 
favor of the crown against those who opposed it. And at the end of this, uh, Louis' forces and the opponents of the crown lost. He retired back to France. They gave him a big money payment to get rid of him. Uh, and the uh, loyal barons proceeded to crown Henry III. He was a nine-year-old boy. Uh, so the people who actually had to make peace and reestablish peace in war-torn England in 1215 and 16 were led by William Marshall, the Earl of Pembroke. William Marshall was an extraordinary man. Uh, he was a, a, a true Renaissance man long before the Renaissance, and he was able to put back together the kingdom. Uh, in 1216, he reissued Magna Carta, had, had actually had King Henry reissue it, uh, and then in 1217, he issued uh, both Magna Carta again and the Forest Charter. And this story I'm going to tell you about tonight is the story of how uh, this all came to be uh, and how, in fact, out of the Forest Charter, the very first roots of environmental law began. Indeed, the Forest Charter is probably the first statute for nature uh, anywhere in the world. If a statute is a written document that is studied and researched and put together on the basis of trying to correct problems about the environment and save the environment for future generations, then as you'll see in a minute, that's what uh, the Forest Charter uh, does for us. Now, the Forest Charter uh, was something which probably uh, John Jay knew about. John Jay and his constitution writing in New York, our New York Constitution was a model for the drafters of the federal constitution. Uh, John Jay was called to uh, England uh, in 1794, and this is uh, Epping Forest, which was a royal forest just outside of England. Now England is around Epping Forest, and Queen Victoria absorbed Epping into uh, uh, England, uh, greatest city, London, in the same way that we designed Central Park. It's, it's the uh, lungs of England. John Jay also made a trip while he was there to uh, visit Falmouth uh, and Dartmoor. And Dartmoor was another royal forest. When he went to uh, this area, uh, this is Dartmoor, uh, it's quite, quite a lovely area as you can see, uh, he went to visit the tin mines, because since the days of the Romans, uh, tin had been mined there, and, and the tin miners had actually formed a, uh, what we might call today a guild, but it was more a body of uh, decision-making. They, uh, they created the stannery laws. Stannery is the laws for who gets to mine tin, when, and where. Uh, and uh, the English, uh, after um, William the Conqueror came, of course, made good use of the tin mines, and in 1201, King John himself granted the charter uh, that had evolved over time for the mining of tin. This area, uh, which is still extant today, and, and as you can see, not only quite expansive, quite large, but also quite beautiful with varied ecological settings, was defined in 1240, when, as one of the requirements of English forest law, a perambulation was conducted by the knights of the area. That means they literally took their horses or on foot and walked around the entire boundary of the uh, royal forest to delineate its bounds so that everyone would know where it was forest and where it wasn't forest. And these perambulations were taking place uh, uh, for many reasons, uh, but largely because they wanted to keep the state from uh, taking over areas that were not forest. So. The tale of, of, of uh, the royal forests is one I'm going to tell tonight, and uh, the reason that there is very little known about it in the United States is we had no royal forests here. When the English came over, they found lots of forests, and the king had no claim to it. The people went out and hunted and fished and collected uh, fuel from the forests and so on without worrying about what their exact rights were. Uh, there were a number of myths about Magna Carta. I'll get to that one in a minute. I'm going backwards here. Uh, but the, the, the myths about Magna Carta uh, are in part uh, uh, that it was not signed. It, it was not a single document. There is no Magna Carta. Magna Carta was reissued many, many times. And as it was reissued, uh, little changes were made. But 
the, there was not much parchment in those days. Uh, there was no paper, and the parchment came, of course, from a cured hide of, 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 a, of a, an animal. And therefore, and, and there was no ink. They made their ink out of uh, little boils in the trees and, and had to conjure up their own ink for the quill pens. And so Magna Carta is that big. The forest charter is only that big. They, they were very scarce in what they could use as materials in the uh, Middle Ages. And so uh, it was it reissued a number of times by a set of scribes, many of whom brought in by the clergy to supplement the royal court because the clergy didn't trust King John and they didn't trust his uh, uh, clerks. So every time Magna Carta was issued in multiple editions, it was sent to be read in the squares and cathedrals throughout England because no one could read. You couldn't post it on a door. So the fact that it was repromulgated and reissued for 200 years and reread meant finally the people came to understand its terms, a very important reality of, of the uh, Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was also not the first time this happened. There had been a number of charters of liberties that had been granted for some time across uh, Europe, not just in England, but they didn't last. The important aspect of Magna Carta and the Carta di Foresta is that it has persisted. In addition, uh, it persisted in ways that it could be reinterpreted. So Chief Justice Edward Koch reinterpreted it to insist upon a Bill of Rights for the people. And that Bill of Rights is the same kind of Bill of Rights we have in our Constitution today. A remarkable evolution. Uh, it also created the basis for uh, uh, the rule of law. And William Blackstone, when he wrote his commentaries on the English law, which John Jay studied, it was the basis for his education as a lawyer, uh, uh, William Blackstone called these the two sacred charters because up until perhaps the 1800s, each one was considered equally important. The fact that we've forgotten the Forest Charter is part of the story for today. Now when, uh, this is Blackstone, uh, when Blackstone uh, published his great book on the, the two charters, uh, he, he had to go to many, many libraries throughout England and find all the texts of these different documents that had been reissued so often to reconcile them, to come up with one co consistent text. And the great thing in our tale tonight of Magna Carta is chapter uh, 48. Uh, this was quite remarkable. King John agreed that a commission of 12 knights could go all around the kingdom and find out and investigate all the things he and his people had done wrong. It was, a, it was an inquiry. Uh, and even though civil war broke out three months after this, the knights continued their assignment. They went around, collected a, a report of what the king had done wrong to the uh, people who were using the forests, uh, and uh, they presented that to uh, William Marshall, the Earl of Pembroke. The forest charter then set in motion uh, a remedy for all these wrongs because the forest charter was defined to correct the evils of King John. And in the course of that, they saved over 150 forests for 800 years, quite a record. And you know these forests. You may not think you know them, but if you've ever read uh, Howard Pyle's The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood, you've been to Sherwood Forest, and in your mind's eye, you can conjure up Sherwood Forest. It's still there, smaller than it once was. If you've read uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's The Hound of the Baskervilles and, and followed Sherlock Holmes uh, through Dartmoor Forest, which is where, of course, John Jay went, you too know that forest. And if you've ever loved the Hundred Acre Wood or read it to your children or grandchildren, you've been to Ashdown Forest, where the Hundred Acre Wood is ensconced in the middle of the forest. So the legacy of these royal forests is something we have even without knowing it uh, here in our country. And just to give you an example, here is the, the Forest of Dean uh, in Gloucestershire. It's an oak forest. It has iron mines. Ever since 800 years ago, there are still free miners who have a charter to go out and dig iron in the ancestral way and persist. And it has a verders court. And one of the great stories of these charters is that 
For 800 years, there has been a special environmental court that still sits today to protect the rights of the commoners, of the free people, in access to and use of these royal forests. So they had an adjudicatory process for uh, protecting their rights. Uh, this, this area is just above Bristol, which is down here. Uh, and as you can see, these forests are not small. They are substantial areas which are widely used today. Uh, these are the spring uh, bluebells uh, uh, in bloom and so on. Now, just to give you a sense of the scale, uh, on the uh, older map, you have all the royal forests uh, as they were uh, after the charter had become part of the statutes in the, royal, in the statutes of the realm. Uh, and here, when you see the green, and there's quite a lot of green in today's map of the Forest Commission, uh, you can see where the royal forests are. I'm going to show you, excuse me, I'm going to show you pictures of the new forest, which is down here. Here is uh, uh, the forest of Dean. Uh, here is Sherlock Forest up here. Um, so these forests are a legacy, uh, which you can go to England and enjoy today. But strangely enough, a lot of tourists don't go there, but many, many people from uh, Great Britain do. And here is the charter, uh, the forest charter. Um, the forest charter was a... Um, uh, issued under seal by uh, Henry III. It was actually uh, developed and, and uh, issued by uh, uh, William Marshall as his regent. Uh, and it was uh, written on the basis of a report, just like a report to Congress or a congressional uh, inquiry or a legislative hearing in Albany is today. It was then... Um, uh, put in as a, uh, ultimately as a statute of the realm when they first created the very first statute book in England, uh, which was only in 1293. Uh, and so when it was promulgated uh, in 1217, it was short, the Forest Charter. And up until that time, Magna Carta had been called the Charter of Runnymede or the Charter of Liberties. It didn't have the name Magna Carta. That name was given to it in 1217 to distinguish it from the charter, the more brief forest charter. And that's when Magna Carta meant longer or great charter. Only 200 years later, and then 400, and then 600 after Coke, did it get the idea that a charter is uh, magna because it's great in giving us and guaranteeing us our liberties. That evolved. When it was issued, this is a, a uh, uh, painting in the British Museum uh, of 1779, imagining King John agreeing to the uh, Magna Carta as a uh, peace effort, uh, but it was, as I've said, uh, the, on, uh, the, the introduction to uh, one of a number of civil wars in England. After repeatedly issuing the Forest Charter, uh, uh, each king, as uh, you've heard, uh, tried to peel back rights of the barons, rights of the towns, rights of the monastery, rights of the free people, uh, and um, uh, one had to constantly reassert these rights. Magna Carta was reasserted for 200 years not because of the liberties in Magna Carta. It was reasserted because the people had to use the forest. They had to go into the forest for their pannage, the running their pigs in to eat acorns. They harvested the wood from the forest. The wood was not a, just a fuel. It helped them build their homes. The forests were the engine of life. There was no industry in 1200. If you didn't get your wealth out of the forest, you didn't live. Uh, you couldn't sell things. You couldn't make things. And so the rights of access to the forest were literally the rights to a job uh, in those early days. And the uh, protection of the forest then morphed into conservation law over 800 years. Now, we celebrated uh, the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. This is the American Bar Association's memorial in Cooper's Hill uh, overlooking Runnymede. Uh, Americans uh, have been celebrating this a little more than the English have. Uh, and the celebration uh, caused uh, the Royal Barge to come up the Thames River from London. Uh, Windsor Castle is very close by, which is where King John hung out when the uh, powers from London came up to negotiate with him uh, and the barons of the north. 
It's an area celebrated by people like Rudyard Kipling in his uh, poem about Runnymede and the reeds that you can still hear at Runnymede. But for the Forest Charter, we don't have a temple like that. Instead, we have this uh, amazing phenomenon of the forests, the forests themselves. The legacy of the Forest Charter is that we have all these natural areas still intact, and we have a tradition in which the public arises to defend their rights to the forest still today in England. It is a rallying cry that we defend our, our rights, not unlike people living around one of our state parks, defends our state parks uh, uh, here in, in uh, New York. The royal uh, forests were ultimately uh, reinvented through uh, many, many statutes of parliament Finally, in 17, or 1971, in the Wild Creatures and Forest Act, Parliament repealed the last remnants of the Forest Charter, uh, which were, had become obsolete because so many laws had, had put it all together. So what were these royal forests? Well, why do people get so passionate about the royal forests, and what can we learn about them? Well, uh, of course, this is what we imagine the forest to be, King John going off with his hunting uh, hounds uh, uh, and carrying forth to catch the deer in the forest. Uh, in medieval England, there was an entire bureaucracy to run the forests. Royal foresters, verders, agisters, uh, wardens, all sorts of people uh, were there to collect revenues for the crown and guarantee that the royal forest served the crown. Uh, when the William the Conqueror came, he set aside forests like the new forests for himself and he was the conqueror. He had the conqueror's justice. There was no verter's court. There was no rights of the common people. Uh, the Peterborough Chronicle in 1087 uh, re re reaccounts what William thought and told the people about the forests. William made great protection of the game and imposed laws for the same that whoso slew hart or hind should be made blind. He preserved the hearts and boars. He loved the stags as much as if he were their father. Moreover, for the hares did he decree that they should go free. And powerful men complained of it, and poor men lamented it. But so for fierce was he that he cared not for the rancor of them all. And that was 1066 and all that. Uh, it happened that that would become, in King John's day, a rather more modest um, phenomenon. Uh, he wanted money, and so he didn't want to kill or blind people. He wanted them to work and pay him. So uh, in John's time, money replaced the corporal punishment that originally uh, uh, the William the Conqueror imposed. And in the days before there were, was paper, and no one could afford paper or ink, these were the ways you made a contract and uh, documented it. These are the tally sticks, and the tally sticks were used to record whether you paid the king a fine, whether you paid, uh, sold him or sold another person, uh, produce, woods, uh, cheese that you had made, whatever it is, all the taxes and money payments were recorded. Uh, each side took, uh, they split the, the uh, uh, hazel stick down the middle and each side recorded the same transaction and you each took one side. And then if there's any doubt about what happened, you'd put the two pieces of wood together again and you had proof that this was the same deal that is recorded. And this was went on for decades before money and other ways of recording took place. And we know the story I've been telling you because these ended up in the king's treasury. He wanted to have an account of who owed him what and who had paid and not paid. And these were preserved, not all, but so many that we can tell the story of, of medieval England. The, uh, public rights to the forest that this money uh, involved were the rights in the Magna Carta granted to free men. Now the free men had these rights before Magna Carta. They were customary rights for uh, scores of years, but they had been denied by the king who wanted to make money, literally, for his wars to regain the Norman lands in France. And so he would take the royal forest border he would extend it into the farmlands of a monastery, a nunnery, a village, a uh, poor person's home, uh, uh, or a baron's estate. And he would now say, you're trespassing on my land. Therefore, you owe me a fine for trespass. This is now my land. What's more, if you want to stay in your house or your farm, you owe me rent. 
so you've got to start paying me annual rent, and what's more, you owe me a certain amount of your produce because that goes along with the fact that I own the land. That's why it was called Sylvan Gangsterism. Uh, needless to say, the barons and the poor people uh, didn't like this. Uh, the barons were, in fact, protecting the rights of uh, the average person to go off and run their pigs as pannage, collect the firewood as stover, uh, bring in the, uh, cat, uh, the, the sheep and the uh, uh, livestock, the, everything from chickens to cows, which was adjustment, cutting turf uh, for fuel, which is tubery, and so on cutting even ferns and other produce of the green vert. Uh, you were not to take the stags, that was venison, that was reserved to the crown. Uh, but the, the right to take vert was very important for the average person. And when they extended the royal forest, all these rights disappeared. So the people who had had rights for several hundred years to come in and take this, rights that William himself said you could continue to do, uh, uh, when John was taking them away, uh, it became a great uh, problem. But it also started a culture in England of defending your rights to the forest. And you'll see how this morphs into some contemporary themes in, in a few minutes. Um, the, uh, the fact that uh, afforestation uh, took place, he was taking these forests, resulted in uh, what were called his evil customs. Uh, and it's in Magna Carta, uh, they call them evil customs, and the knights went out to try to change that. The parts of Magna Carta that gave rise to the forest parter were the, the fact that uh, these evil customs were to be rejected. Uh, all the land you've afforested and taken to the crown must be disafforested. He did the same thing to access to the riverbanks where people had to go for fishing. Uh, and uh, he, the Magna Carta authorized these 12 knights to go across the land and investigate the evil customs so they could be abolished. In eight centuries later, we find uh, rambling, the right to go into a forest and go hiking and wandering around, even if the adjacent areas are uh, privately owned. Uh, uh, we still find people wanting to exercise their rights to run their cattle or their pigs into the forest. Uh, we have a new generation of, of rights that have continued to uh, come into being, and I'll give you two examples of them. Uh, some of you have been, perhaps, to the New Forest. It was the first of William's forests. It's quite a, a huge area. Uh, it has survived through all the wars. In the Second World War, it was a staging area for, for preparing troops uh, to cross the channel. Uh, they did it in such a way that it did not destroy the forest. And t still today, people run their pigs into the forest uh, in order to collect the acorns. They also, by eating all the acorns, keep the horses and the deer from eating the acorns because if the horses and the deer eat the acorns, they get sick. It's not healthy for them. And there are several thousand wild ponies running throughout here uh, in the forest. They have as much right to be there as any of the people as they ramble. Of course, so do the deer. Uh, and as you can see, this is not, these are people, uh, this is not a small uh, uh, set of forests. This is a part of the forest primeval. And here it is, the royal forest, kept alive by forest law, but not just in terms of what's written down, but the verderer's court. I was privileged to go to one of their monthly court sessions and hear a, a woman, perhaps in her 70s, complain that uh, a, uh, some flints, sharp rocks, had been dumped in a crossing of a stream uh, so that a truck, presumably, could cross the stream and collect fire, not firewood, timber that was going to be cut on the other side and come back. And these flints were uh, very um, harmful, uh, potentially, to horses' hooves. And she went riding every day in her 70s, and she demanded that uh, these flints be removed and that the, the passage over the stream be restored because this interfered with her common right of access uh, to the forest. And these are the men who go out and inspect when a, a woman like that comes forth to complain. She took the, uh, she rose here up into the, the bench. She gave testimony. Uh, and uh, they then uh, or ordered these fellows in livery uh, to go out and inspect her claim and determine what was wrong. And then they would hear a report and issue orders for the restoration of the access common rights that she claimed. Uh, the same thing, of course, goes on in other places. This is the Forest of Dean. Uh, just to suggest that uh, we've not seen the end of uh, royal prerogatives, 
uh, during uh, King Charles the first time, he was also expanding the forests. Uh, and indeed, even, even under Cromwell, he was trying to get money by expanding the forests. Uh, and so there was actually a riot, uh, which would be looked upon as a revolution today, in 1631 and 32, called the Western Rising. And uh, in 1639, 22,000 acres had been claimed by the crown, uh, and people literally rioted because they said, you have no right to do that. This is public forest. It's not your forest just because you're the king, uh, and we demand uh, our rights. And what they did was they built uh, a house called Speech House, uh, and they created a, uh, this is the Verder's Court for the Forest of Dean. Uh, the Verder's Court doesn't meet monthly the way the one in uh, New Forest does. It meets quarterly to manage the wild boar, to oversee sheep grazing, and to deal with the, the flora and fauna, the, the, the plant life and the deer life, the venison, as well as to adjudicate the rights of the uh, uh, miners who still uh, dig mine in the traditional way. So there you are, uh, hands off the forest. And around the forest of Dean, a citizens' movement has ar arisen to defend the uh, free rights, and not just the rights of the miners, because when Parliament in 1981 decided to guarantee the economic rights of, of these miners, they took away a lot of the rights of the commoners to come in and do other things. They c adopted a law called the Countryside and Rights of Way Act 2000, or CROW, Crow. But Crow didn't protect the rights in Dean very well, because there were few of these statutory right-of-ways. Uh, uh, and, and so the people began to say, what's, your, what, what's missing? What are our rights today? We want cycle tracks. We want places for the, the bicyclists. We want bridle paths. We want the, the, the horse paths uh, to be established and the right-of-way for uh, uh, horses and, and riders. We want wheelchair users to have access to this area, make special provision for them. And we want baby buggies, because mothers and little babies have a right to go on these trails, too. So this is quite a far cry from Panage and, and uh, the original rights of the forest. Uh, and so what do we have out of this? Well, it seems to me the culture that we have in this story of the English forests and the forest charter was found in uh, chapter 17 of the forest charter itself. These were liberties that were taken by the people at all levels of the socioeconomic ladder. These liberties of the forest and free customs traditionally had both within and without the royal forests are granted to all in the realm. In short, to everyone. Everyone is also obliged to observe the liberties and customs granted in the forest charter. This is one of the first expressions of environmental rights or natural rights that we find in any legal system in the world. And it's still functioning today. Uh, and the question the royal uh, that I, I ask myself, and I'm continuing to study, and we'll go to England next year to do some further analysis of this with original documents, is how can we replicate this story of 800 years today? We're losing forest cover uh, all over the world. There are other places that can protect forests. What can we learn from the story of the forest charter that can replicate it in other places? The UN just adopted in September an obligation to sustainably manage the world's forests, combat desertification, and halt and reverse land degradation and biodiversity loss. That won't happen just because the UN proclaims it. We're going to have to find the ways in which it happens and how law is not just something on the law books, but becomes a cultural phenomenon, a cultural desire of the people uh, to uh, act to protect the forest. And we did that with the Adirondacks. We did it with Article 14. Uh, we will have, as some of you know, in, uh, 12, in 2017, and only a year from now, in November, a vote on all. All of us will be asked to cast a ballot. Do you wish to convene a constitutional convention to rewrite the New York State Constitution? We must do that every 20 years. And in the past, we've voted it down. We haven't amended the Constitution in this way since 1938. But people are so irritated with government today uh, from all walks of life that they might vote yes. And then we will have a constitutional convention. The legislature is appropriating $1 million this April uh, to convene a temporary state commission to prepare and educate the voters about this vote. Uh, and 
This is either an opportunity to reaffirm Article 14 and strengthen the environmental rights and our protection of the environment in New York, uh, or to do something else. Now, in Europe, <clears throat> it's quite interesting. Uh, uh, there's a movement to create the environmental rule of law, which is really what the Forest Charter did, and European courts have been finding a right to the environment as a component of human rights and actually in imposing that as a limitation on the state. So I think the ultimate story of the commons of the Forest Charter is can we extend the commons to the ultimate commons, uh, our own planet and the parts that we share on this planet. If we can learn from what was done over the last 800 years for the Royal Forest in England, then I think we have a optimistic chance to do it right for the atmosphere, to do it right for the oceans. Uh, the UN began negotiating just this year, it'll begin this summer, uh, the negotiation of a biodiversity convention for the high seas. There is no biodiversity conservation on the oceans and the high seas, and we will have something. Uh, hopefully it will be as strong as the forest charter going forward. And bit by bit, we're taking this culture of nature conservation and creating a global ethic for it. So the Forest Charter has lots to teach us. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions, and it's a great privilege to share the tale of the Forest Charter with you one year before its 800th anniversary. Thank you. That was great. Um, so have the forest escaped the degradation of the commons because it's so multi-use and always has been multi-use? Is that what? I think that's a part of it. As you use the forest, you create your own personal relationship to it, whether it's economic or aesthetic or uh, for other reasons. So I think it's very important that uh, protected areas be open to people. Uh, and when they are and people invest themselves in their right to be in a place, they come to know it and love it and protect it. So I think you're right. I think it's a good observation. Whether, whether we can replicate that uh, to make ourselves see ourselves in these other places uh, is the challenge. So in England before all of this, when they were essentially Obviously, centuries before, there were tribes that, would, that were essentially battling each other for control of, of their... Was, were, were, were lands felt to be under the control, ownership in some basis, of a particular tribe, um, druids, Celts, whatever, su such that when, when one conquered territory, the ownership of that land and all of these rights came with it? Well, the ownership, uh, the forests only begin in 1066 with the invasion of uh, William from France. Before that, there were lots of rules about nature and the access to nature and allocate, allocating uses to the forest uh, that the Saxons had, the Angles had, and the Vikings brought down as they settled and had, and the Celts and the Picts. Uh, and they didn't think of property, as far as I can tell from historical studies, in the way we think of it with a distinct border and a deed. They thought of using nature, driving wealth from nature. So what we call usufrux, that is the right for a limited amount of time to do something with nature, uh, was what was important, rather than who ha actually owned the nature. Uh, and even when the barons had, uh, after William allocated the land to his uh, uh, feudal uh, sublords, they had territory, but they were much more interested in helping uh, the, the villeins, the ones who were tied to the land, or the liber homo, the free people, uh, work the land, because the land was worth nothing if they couldn't extract wealth from the land. So even there, the usufrux, the, the user's rights, were more important than the delineation of land itself. Uh, and throughout, there were more commons than there was limited land. So I think uh, the interesting thing about the story is that it's how do you manage the commons, uh, the shared lands, the shared rights even to private lands. Uh, and 
Uh, we do it very differently uh, in North America. We evolved in a different way. Uh, but I think we can learn something out of the royal forests and studying how they, how they survived 800 years of turmoil, uh, intact, more or less. How would you compare the collective attitude toward this sort of thing in the UK and the US? I mean, we have struggles about should we introduce the wolves to Yellowstone? There are struggles about uh, should the buffalo run free? or kick off the cattle? I mean, where, where are we in terms of our two national attitudes toward this issue? Well, in England, uh, this boar had been extinguished from the Forest of Dean, and uh, a bunch of vigilantes, if you will, decided it was time to bring them back. And so nobody knows when they came back to Dean, but one of the great functions of the Verderer's Court now is actually to manage them, because they were once extinct in the forest, then they came back, now they manage them, there, there has to be a cull, they have to manage how many there can be. Uh, and so uh, there's a system for it. Now in terms of what we did in introducing the wolves back into uh, Yellowstone, we were trying to put back an apex predator which had lost its habitat, if you will, and the result was many different evolutionary changes took place. Uh, the forest, uh, the, the wolves seem to have had a, a good effect on a number of things, including uh, vegetation, because the number of elk and deer and other species that were mowing down uh, the vegetation because there was too many of them were being eaten now by the wolves, and therefore a balance in the landscape was being restored. The question, of course, is what happens to greater Yellowstone right outside the border? Can you, in fact, deal with that buffer area? And England has had the same problem. One of the reasons that um, the royal forests are so important is that uh, the spillover effect uh, uh, affects the user rights of the adjacent lands. So if you live near a royal forest, you can't do things that harm the forest. And if you have common rights to the forest, you probably have them outside the forest. You just go in and out. And when you come back, you exercise the same stewardship you had before. So England, ever since the medieval period, is crisscrossed with walking paths. They've been largely statutorily protected now, but they went wherever people walked, because in the Middle Ages, not everyone had a horse, uh, and so these pathways were more important. Uh, and the right to ramble or follow these pathways uh, became so traditional that uh, property owners couldn't extinguish it, and they tried. Uh, one of the things the kings did was to hand over land uh, to bring money into the crown. Uh, and then the new uh, property owners tried to exclude the commoners from these uh, aristocratic estates. Uh, and there have actually been, even into the 30s and 40s, riots in parts of England and Scotland where a property owner would try to extinguish the rights of prior uh, access, whether it was to get fishing rights or, or exercise fishing rights or walking rights or uh, bridle paths and, and horse access and so on. I mean, you can't imagine us rising up and rioting as, as a tool. We'd bring a lawsuit instead, uh, and we do a lot of that. But in England, uh, they take direct action. And so there are cultural differences in how we protect nature. I think the remarkable thing about the establishment of the Adirondack Forest Preserve is that it was established at a point where we had really destroyed much of the Adirondacks. Not all, but significant areas. Vast forest fires, uh, the forest fires had eroded the hills so much that uh, in the spring the floods would bring down the mud and, the, and Albany twice couldn't convene the legislature in the spring because downtown Albany was underwater. That was before they built the federal dam at, at Troy. But we then took the lands that had been abandoned by these aggressive uh, uh, timber barons, if you will, wildcat timber operators, and we, they didn't pay their taxes. So we seized their land for their back taxes and started the forest preserve. And every year since 1894, when it was put into the Constitution as forever wild forest land, New Yorkers have added more and more land to the forest preserve. So the Forest Preserve is now larger than the state of Vermont and uh, Massachusetts combined. It's a huge area, and 50% of it has people living in it, and the 50% that doesn't is full of people visiting it, uh, which is the point you made. There's, we, we value the Adirondack statewide because we all have access to it. The people who live in it 
get, get it all year round, but the rest of us can go whenever we want. And over 50% of the Adirondacks is very much like the public access of the royal forests. Uh, so it doesn't have to happen in the way I've told the story here. It can happen in other places. I could give you another example, which I've studied at length, which are the Zapobiedniki. So Zapobiedniki in Russia actually go back to the time of the Tsar. They were perpetuated and expanded under Lenin. Uh, the early conservationists in Russia went to, after the Soviet Revolution, went to Vladimir Ilyich Lenin and said, Vladimir Ilyich, don't you like parks and nature? And he said, yes, as a little boy, I always liked parks. And then they quoted that as their writ to go off and save more and more parks for the next 70 years. And so Zapovjedniki are the largest wild areas in the world, and under the, Stalin cut them back a little bit, but under all of the other Soviet leadership and under Yeltsin and under now Putin, they have maintained the, the wilderness of this area. And there is a dedicated group of citizens who do just what these people do in England, or the ones who fight to save the Adirondacks. They are organized to fight to stop anyone from uh, making trouble for the Zapovjedniks uh, in Russia today. And they're huge areas. We could look at similar examples that are going on uh, that don't get told very well about the Amazon. Uh, and I, th I, think, I think there is something about the human relationship to nature that finds its way into uh, customary practice and then law, but the law alone is not enough. It has to be a cultural value that people will stick up for. And that is a phenomenon you can see in a number of places around the world today. I was just wondering, as a young person, what can I do to help protect the environment and you know, try to slow the, the rate of climate change? Well, you, it's a great question because of course you'll live with the consequences longer than many of us. So um, I think there are some things that we need to do which are, we're not doing uh, that are easy to do. Um, we in New York have managed to save most of our peat Peat is dead plant matter. Peat is one of the things that have been saved in the royal forest. Peat has been around since the last ice age. It gradually accumulates. It's very slow to assemble. And uh, peat does not release uh, through its organic um, decomposition the carbon dioxide from its past photosynthesis uh, or the methane that's in it because it's always underwater. It's wet. As soon as you dry it out, these gases are released. Uh, in our wetlands laws in New York, we encapsulate all those gases because they're in the wetlands underwater. But in Indonesia today, uh, they are allowing the uh, peat forests to be burned and for palm oil plantations and pulp mills, so much so that Indonesia is now as big a greenhouse gas emitter as is the United States of America or China. Uh, and it's not part of the Paris Agreement, and it's all because they're allowing the peat to get destroyed. So one of the things we have to do is say we're going to protect the 3% of the world's terrestrial environment, which is made up of peat. Um, most people don't even know that fact. So one of the things that, that uh, young people need to do today is to take a look at the carbon cycle, the full carbon cycle, and say, what are the missing pieces? Uh, it's easy to say we can quickly move off of coal and quickly move into uh, alternative energy systems. New York State is probably the leading state right now in terms of promoting alternative energy. Um, Con Edison, as you probably know, doesn't make electricity anymore. Con Edison only uh, sells it, commits to conveying it to you, and helps you reduce less electricity. So Con Ed will actually pay you to put in insulation, to put in a, a low energy appliance, a new refrigerator or something like that. They give you money to help do that because it will use less electricity. And their entire business model is how to use less electricity. If we use less and use it more efficiently, we produce less greenhouse gases. So I think what we have to do is essentially move off of 
uh, the old systems of producing electricity to new systems as fast as we can. And if you Google uh, uh, the Public Service Commission's work and ICERTA's work in Albany, it's REV, REV, you'll see all the things that are happening in New York to make that happen. So you can be part of that. And promoting alternative energy systems uh, is a direct way of doing that. Uh, encouraging uh, the better protection and sequestration of greenhouse gases uh, is critical. Uh, one of the most effective things each one of us can do is plant more trees. Uh, and planting trees is an absolutely wonderful uh, gimmick because every tree especially the young ones that are growing for some time, sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so a tree is absorbing all of this greenhouse gas, and meanwhile, you've planted a tree, and it's aesthetically pleasing, and it's helping other kinds of uh, biota uh, relationships with nature. Uh, so one of the things that we need to start doing much more of is what the Arbor Day Foundation has been preaching for a long time. And you can Google the Arbor Day Foundation. Some of you probably contribute to it. But you can plant trees. And uh, there's an entire program in New York uh, that uh, is all about uh, giving trees, in fact, to citizen organizations to plant them along small streams and tributaries in order to keep the erosion and sedimentation from happening. So here in Westchester, there are programs where you don't have to do it yourself. You can just join people who want to plant trees and plant trees. And I think planting trees is fun. Uh, it's not just a good thing for nature. Uh, you get dirty and wet and enjoy it. Uh, and it's the uh, same thing as we get out of, uh, out of gardening, but you're gardening for nature. So I think there are endless small things, but just as we got into this climate change problem uh, incrementally and didn't happen overnight, we're going to get out of it incrementally, bit by bit. And so every bit that any one of us does in this regard helps. Um, when a society does something, uh, such as save the royal forest, then it's, a, um, it's an accumulative effect in the right direction. And I think we need to protect more open space. I think we need to protect more parkland. I think around every state park, there should be a buffer zone in New York that protects the state park, and we should extend uh, uh, the protection of the park out into the community. I think Every stream and tributary in this county uh, is, whether it's on public or private land, uh, ought to be a opportunity for the cultural enhancement of the environment. Uh, not just to keep pollution out of the streams from the runoff from our roads and so on, but to bring back the small aquatic life that then brings back the food chain. Uh, and so I think looking at what a town or a village is doing uh, to protect its, the water courses that go through the town is very important because these have not been regarded as the subjects of zoning law and planning law. They were just things we planned around and didn't really have to deal with and tried to put aside and paved over and put into pipes. And we need to go back to a stewardship approach to uh, our watersheds and the water courses in our community so if you were to show up at the local planning board meeting and say that, they'd be shocked. At the, you, you'd begin pushing in the right direction. Bed for 2020 is the leading program in Westchester for how to uh, be sustainable as we go forward, and they've worked on it for a long time. It's and you good. probably still have one more hour to go vote. Right? Today's election day, town board, so you can still make it. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you so much. Well, uh, Nick is going to be signing copies of his book over here. And please stick around and have a glass of wine and talk with us. We're so glad you came and uh, keep coming back this spring. The, the, Thank you. The story of the Forest Charter is in one chapter of the book the ABA published, and there's flyers and one or two books back there if you're interested. Thank, Thank you, you so no, that was much. Lovely. Really.